Good. I hope God's doing amazing things in your life because God is doing amazing things in everybody's life. And sometimes we don't necessarily see the amazing things that God is doing. And so why are we here? What's our vision? What are we supposed to be doing? To awaken the image of God in all people. It's up there somewhere. <laughs> I, I, I put this out of order. I messed, I messed everybody's brain up, so, you know, that's okay. To awaken the, and we're going to do this five ways. You remember the five ways? First way we're going to do this is through evangelism, spreading the good news, spreading the news about Jesus. Second way we're going to do this is discipleship, teaching them how to love Jesus. The third way we're going to do this is through fellowship, coming together as a group in the, in the love of Jesus, worship by expressing our life for Jesus, and finally, ministry by helping each other. Ministry has been a difficult one lately. That's why there is no bulletin, because uh, we, there's really nothing planned, uh, you know, because we're, we're trying to figure out what to do with all this. We're going, we're going along with other churches and other things, so... You know, we just play, I, you know, listen, I am so proud of my church <laughs> because I have been on these district meetings um, for the last four months, every Monday, there's been a district meeting, Zoom, there was one time we had 60 some pastors on a Zoom meeting all at once, and um, they're just telling me things that they're going through because of this COVID and shutting down their building, and you guys have been so flexible and easygoing and hey everything's cool and you know hey we'll just you know, we're gonna worship outside we're gonna worship inside you know we don't know what we're doing this week but that's okay we're just gonna you know you were you were you guys were very good with the live stream a lot of people watched us through the live stream when the building was shut down and it is just so neat to be a part of this church and if you haven't noticed a difference in sound there is a huge difference in sound in here this morning because <laughs> of the two new speakers. So, um, again, glad you're all here. Timothy's going to come and read Philippians chapter 2, verses uh, 27 to 30. Philippians chapter 1, verses 27 to 30. Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then, whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in the one, one spirit, striving to, together as one for the faith of the gospel, without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. This is a sign to them that they will be destroyed, but that you will be saved. And that by God, for it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him, since you are going through the same struggle you saw I had, and now hear that I still have. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for this day. I want to thank you for this opportunity to come and worship inside and come together and praise you. Watch over us today and watch over Raymond as he preaches for us today. In your name we pray. Amen.
for today. How well it, I just, I'm sorry. I'm just so excited how, you know, we got, it's like not feedbacking and it's not ringing and it doesn't sound how, I'm just, I'm sorry. It doesn't take much to excite me. <laughs> Takes very little, but hey, that's okay. It, I've also noticed that I row more in church, the church building, than I do outside. It's like outside, if I went into the sun, then I would start getting really hot. And, and so I really, you know, I didn't roam as much. And then this morning I found myself like talking over here somewhere. Uh, I don't know, I, as I've grown up in life, um, you know how you, you say, I don't know if you've ever done this in your own life, but I know in my life periodically I've said this, you know, I'm never going to do that. And what, is, what, what, what do people tell you when you say, I'm never going to? Don't say never, okay? Hey, Joey, can you, can, since you brought it in, could you? Kind of put that up for me now. <laughs> Thank you. Joey Strope, everybody. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, it says that's, you know, never say never. And what, what, the reason why we say that to people is because we, we, we believe a lot of times in our lives that there's no such things as absolutes. You know, th you know, there's always something that will keep something from being an absolute. My son is great at this. You know, I say everything is going to happen like this. No, it's not. You got, and they can think of that one one billionth, one trillionth of a, a possibility of it not happening, and and it doesn't become an absolute. I ran across an interesting, um, an interesting quote from this passage, and it says. In life, there are no absolutes. No matter how poor, bad, rich, wicked, evil, good, anything is, it is not an absolute. Absolute, as a term, doesn't apply to anything or anyone in life. And uh, we kind of, we, I'm, not sure, I'm not sure if the world actually believes this, but the whole idea of absolutes is very difficult when it comes to understanding life when it comes to understanding the Bible, when it comes to understanding a lot of things. And sometimes when we think that there are absolutes in this world, we can, you know, there are some things that we believe that are absolutes in this world, like taxes. <laughs> taxes are absolute. As a matter of fact, my geometry teacher, when I was in high school, constantly told me there are two things that you have to do, die and pay taxes. <laughs> and we were like, we're only teenagers. We don't pay taxes. Said, okay. Did you buy bubble gum? Yeah, you pay taxes. One of the one absolute in life is gravity, right? Gravity is an absolute, right? Okay, gravity. Well, no, I'm, gravity is an absolute. If you put a car, if you put. Just like this. <laughs> hey, Raylan. This is where the video thing goes. The, 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 yeah, but, but, shh. <laughs> yeah, see, gravity is absolute because <laughs> you, you put the car in neutral and you go uphill. Uh, if, you, if you don't know this, this is from Gravity Hill, Pennsylvania, and there's spots all over Gravity Hill where if you put the car in neutral, you'll go uphill. Yep, it's, it's Gravity Hill, Pennsylvania, just outside by Ligonier, around that area. And um, uh, another, another absolute is change. Change is going to happen, right? No matter what happens in your life, change happens. 
I was here 20 years ago, and after being with you guys for 20 years, I'm now gray. <laughs> I didn't blame it on you. I just said, after being with you for 20 years, you're the one who took it that. <laughs> okay? Uh, but the problem with change is that change doesn't change. Once change happens, it's no longer an absolute. Because change doesn't change the same way all the time. Because every time change changes, it's a changing a different way. So it's not really an absolute because you don't know how it's going to change the next time it changes. <laughs> okay, think about that one for a while. <laughs> Dying is an absolute, right? Yeah, unless you're Elijah. <laughs> And if, and if Christ returns anytime soon, I would hope that, uh, <laughs> you know, I, 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 don't, I don't speak for anybody else, but I just speak for myself. If Christ returns anytime soon, I'm not dying. The past is the past, right? Unless you have a time machine. That was, that was, fa the other ones weren't supposed to be funny. <laughs> Do you have a time? And see, see, after watching all these sci-fi things, I don't know if I'm living in reality, an alternate reality, if somebody's gone in the past, into the future. I don't know anything anymore. It, these, these alternate reality. Watch the Flash that my son loves the most, and there's like 17 alternate re Earths, okay? And, they're on, and, they all, and I'm like, I'm done. The thing is, is that the Bible is full of absolutes. And one of the things for generations that teenagers and young people have a problem with is something called absolute truth. Is the message of Jesus, is the gospel the absolute truth? And we, even us, even we as Christians have a difficult time with absolutes. We don't necessarily believe in our minds that absolutes exist. And the Bible is full of them. And Paul uses an absolute here in Philippians chapter 1, verse 27. He starts this verse out this way. He says, whatever happens. The NIV, the new NIV is the only translation that uses, translates it like this, this word like this as whatever happens. It's, this word means only. It's an absolute. This, only if this happens. Whenever, whatever happens, it doesn't matter what happens. It, it usually, most of the translations is only, and, and it says only, and then it goes on, and then Paul goes on. And the problem with that is you're not really sure if it's a, it's, if it's a contraction coming into something new. But what Paul is basically saying, and this is a very good understanding of it, is that whatever happens. Now, we sometimes wonder, why doesn't he say absolutely whatever happens? The reason why we don't put that in there is because, again, Paul didn't write that word. Okay? We're trying to write the Bible according to what, we're trying to translate the Bible according to what the author wrote. And he wrote whatever happens. Paul is telling the saints in Philippi to, that, that no matter what happens in their life, they are to respond in agape love. No matter what struggle they're facing, no matter what happens, only do this no matter what happens. And basically, that's the literal translation of this world. Only do this whatever happens. Whether you're happy or sad, hungry or full, thirsty or satisfied, rich or poor, joyous or suffering, but then again, we've discovered that joyously and suffering are actually the same thing. Hurting or comfortable, angry or calm, right or wrong, it doesn't matter the situation. That's the absolute. It doesn't matter whether you're hot and irritated or cool and comfortable. This is the only way you are to act. Absolutely. This is what you are supposed to be doing because you are one of the saints. Remember, this, this letter was written to the saints at Philippi, okay, and, and to the church. And he is saying, you are the saints, and I don't care 
what excuse you give me, I don't care what has happened in your life, this is what you do. Paul, Paul, Paul is very thankful in the, to, for the church of Philippi because they have a, a good work, a great work has started, an amazing work has, a started, has started in their lives and it's continuing to work. And he sees this growth. He sees the work of salvation in their lives and it's beginning to grow in their lives each day, each moment. And with this salvation comes, and with this growth, it's a growth in maturity. They are growing up. And what do we learn what maturity is? Maturity is being able to express agape love, self-defying love in all situations in life. This is what Paul is saying. No matter what you are going through, I don't care what your excuse is. I don't care where you are at financially. I don't care where you are at mentally, emotionally, physically, relationally, it doesn't matter, no excuses, this is the way you do something. This is what you do. You live in agape love. And as Paul is struggling, he uses himself as an example of how he can use this agape love, the self-denying love, in order to spread the gospel to everybody. Because what do we find out? That when we struggle, that's when we experience joy. Yeah, I know. Us Americans who always want something and feel happy and, eu and euphoric and everything, and it's all about the happiness of life, and you know, these people aren't happy, and those people, we've got to make everybody happy. That isn't what they're saying. Paul, Paul, or even James, and I was corrected when I got home because I misquoted a verse, okay? James in chapter 1 says, Consider it pure joy when you go through many trials and temptations. Last week, no, did I say it wrong again? <laughs> I'm going to make you say it. <laughs> Last week, I used the word persecution. And Paul says that when you go through many trials throughout life, consider that pure joy. In actuality, what James is saying is that we experience joy when we go through these struggles when we have hard times. And so Paul is rejoicing because of the weakness of the Philippians, and he's rejoicing because of the weakness of him, because Paul, Paul understands that the weaker he is, the stronger Christ is. The weaker he is, the stronger that Christ is. And so Paul wants to teach the Philippian church a few absolutes of life. Okay, and the Bible is full of them. But these are three absolutes that I want you to understand. I want everybody to understand. Whoever is listening to this message, please understand these absolutes. The first one is going to be life-changing for some of us. Philippians, uh, Philippians 1, 27 to 30, Paul gives us three absolutes. He says this. Whatever happens, there's another slide there, conduct yourself in a manner. Whatever happens, doesn't matter what you're going through in life. It doesn't matter where you are. It doesn't matter if you're addicted to something. It doesn't matter if you're struggling with something. It doesn't matter if you call yourself a saint. It doesn't matter if you're living on the street, if you're living in a home, if you have money, if you don't have money. does not matter where you are at. does not matter what you are doing. You are to conduct yourself in a manner. Now, this is actually a, a, a this, this phrase here is actually a word. The word actually means Roman citizen because Philippi was full of a lot of, even though it was not part of the Roman empire or close to Rome, the Philippi was uh, full of a lot of Roman citizens. It actually was considered at one time little Rome because of the number of citizens that was there. And a lot of the people in church, in, in the Philippian church, were of Roman citizenship. And when Paul wrote this letter, he is basically saying, he is literally saying to them, conduct yourself like a Roman citizen. That is the word that he is using here problem with that word is 
back then you really only had one government, the Roman government, okay? And so you, and when, when someone said, conduct yourself as a Roman citizen, you knew what that meant. There was a criteria. There was an ethical uh, understanding of what it meant to be a Roman citizen. Today, if you said, conduct yourself like an American citizen, somebody in another country would be like, okay, uh, American citizen, they, uh, they, 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 they consume too much, they're greedy, they're unloving. We in our country, even in our own country, if you are if you're ever on Facebook, to be a citizen of the United States, everybody has a different understanding of what it means to be a citizen of the United States. So we couldn't write, so the, tr the translation here could not be could not we could not say that this that we are supposed to be roman citizens because we wouldn't understand what that was unless we had a huge understanding of what it meant to be a roman citizen so we are so the, the better understanding of this is to conduct yourself in a matter to live in a certain way to be free in a certain way uh, to 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 have a certain conduct or characteristic or an ethical practice a certain way, you are to conduct yourself as if, the better version of this is as if you were a citizen of heaven. Now, the reason why they didn't put citizen of heaven is because that's not what Paul said. But Paul is saying conduct yourself as a citizen, as a citizen of heaven, as somebody who is representing heaven. And so no matter what we do, no matter what we face, we are supposed to conduct ourselves in a certain way. How are we supposed to do this? Paul goes on and says, conduct yourself in a manner worthy. Now look, verse 27 is one of the most powerful verses that I've run across in a long time. It's a life-changing verse because this verse here, it, it, this word here, worthy, is actually the most important word in this sentence that Paul writes in this verse. Paul is saying, whatever happens, conduct yourself in a manner like the citizens of heaven, worthy. This word worthy um, means in a manner that does not take away, in, in, in a way that shows the depth you're supposed to conduct yourself in a way that shows the depth of agape love. It's, we're supposed to, we're supposed to, it's, it, it's a word that has a very strong ethical meaning. It shows the depth of who we are on the inside. Paul wants us to act ethically, worthy. You are honored this. You have something in us. We all possess something in our lives that no matter what is going on in our life, we have to act a certain way that we are worthy of that possession. We own something. Each and every one of us owns something that Paul wants us to live our life in word, thought, or deed. No matter what is going on, no matter what is happening to you, you possess something and you are supposed to act a certain way so that, when you, so that your life is worthy of the gift that, you, that it was given to you. Here, here's, a, here's kind of an example. Your, your kid gets their license at 16, 17, 18 years old, right? And, and what do a lot of parents do nowadays? They give them their first car. But in order to have that license, in order to have that car, you have to be worthy of that car. So, you know, if you're a good parent and your, kid, your child goes out and they get into a speeding, a speeding ticket, that car should be taken away because they're not acting worthy of that gift. You ground them. You say you can't, you know, can't use the car for, for 24 hours, you know. <laughs> Make a real strong statement. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I know. <laughs> you know. Because, you know, even if the, you let them borrow your car, they should be worth, you, know, you, you, you know, they should be worthy of the use of that car, the use of, use of that gift that you have given to them. So what are we supposed to be worthy of? 
That's the question. What are we supposed to worthy, be worthy of? Get this, okay? Watch. Whatever happens, doesn't matter where you are in your life, it doesn't matter what excuse you're making, it doesn't matter who you are, it doesn't matter whether you've been treated fairly or not. Conduct yourself, be a good citizen, be a person of good worth, conduct yourself in a manner worthy of this gift. And that gift is the gospel of Christ. Conduct yourself worthy, conduct yourself in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. No matter what we are doing in our lives, no matter what has happened, no matter what goes on, no matter where you're at, we are to live our lives worthy of the gospel of Christ. Now, what does that mean, the gospel of Christ? We're supposed to live our lives worthy of the gospel of Christ. So, Follow, <laughs> no, it's not following the handbook. And that's very good because that's what we think. It's to act like what the Bible tells us to act like. Okay, so hang on. Gabrielle, I'm going to use your pretty handwriting. She didn't know how she was doing this, and now she suckered into it. <laughs> Gabrielle's going to write on the board. I don't care where you put it, okay? Okay, you can put up here the gospel of Christ right up here. Right up there, the gospel of Christ. Okay, you want me to lift you up? <laughs> okay, she's going to write the gospel of Christ. Now, we got other ones right there. Oh, no, that's okay. <laughs> Joey's going to be around, so <laughs> it'll be quite okay. <laughs> Okay. The gospel of Christ. We are supposed to act like ourselves worthy of the gospel of Christ. Okay. So what do you think is the gospel of Christ? Christ. To be, okay, to be Christ-like. Yeah, once you're done about the gospel of Christ, then write down to be Christ-like. Okay. All right, anybody else? Hang on, I don't have my glasses on, so I can't, I can't hear you. His birth, death, and resurrection is the gospel of Christ. To be Christ-like. What else? Come on. Come on. There's no right or wrong answer unless you put in child um, sacrifice. That kind of would be wrong. <laughs> but changing. There's a changing that goes on because of the gospel. Changing. It's for changing. There's a changing that goes on because of the gospel of Christ. What else? Living in grace, okay? In order to understand what Paul is saying here, we have to understand the gospel of Christ, okay? What else? Okay. Living in the word, um, put grace, word of God. I think that's the, those are actually two different things. What else? Sanctification, Holy Spirit, put, you can put the big word of sanctification down um, or just and put Holy Spirit there. <laughs> hey, think of this one. Birth, death, and resurrection of Christ. What? Christ in you? What is the... See, thought this was going to kind of happen when we think about the salvation of christ we're actually thinking about actions we're thinking about hey, just hang on you're not done okay just want to see you go anywhere. we're thinking about events okay we're thinking about rules okay life changing we think about those things but there's more to that what happened at his death redeemed what happened to christ at his death 
suffering, anguish, denying himself. When he was born, God gave up a, a part of himself. He gave up himself. He offered a gift. Purity. Resurrection, we kind of hit on the resurrection. That's where the purity comes from. Sanctification in the Holy Spirit. This, you can write down purity. This one right here, the Holy Spirit, is something that we really don't think about in our lives all the time. When was the last time you asked the Holy Spirit to help you? So he's God or Jesus. We don't pray to the Holy Spirit. But if, if we have the Trinity, shouldn't we pray that the Holy Spirit, pray for the Holy Spirit to come upon you? We have um, uh, death. Jesus, Jesus died on the cross. Put that, put that one down, death. I don't care where. Oh, we did put death. <laughs> it's right there. <laughs> there you go. Underline. Anything else that you can think of? Service. Very good. We can even use worship. We can use some of the things that we were talking about this morning. Fellowship. Discipleship, ministry, that's actually service, but that's very good. Nothing. Can't flip it over. It's all one piece. <laughs> you know, if, even evangelism. We can go on and on and on to understand the gospel of Christ. I discovered this past week with this one sentence in Paul's writing. You're, thank you. You can, you can sit down. The Gabriel de Camillo. I discovered in this one sentence that we sometimes do not understand when we use the gospel of Christ or the gospel of we don't understand the depth of the meaning of that. It means, it literally means that God died. The good news is that God died. See, when people say, when people say, well, God's dead. There, there was, back in the 70s, there's this big movement, the God is dead movement, that there's no God. You know, look at the church, it's dead, God is dead. And my answer was, you're right. God is dead, and then he arose again. See, we actually believe in a God that died on the cross. He was dead and buried for three days, and he arose again. And so, so we don't look at the gospel, the good news, so-and-so died. You know, it, it, just this morning, it was, it, was, it was not good news, okay? You know, um, uh, sacrifice, pain, suffering. Is all part of the gospel of Jesus. You have a good, you have what we would call the positive and the negative. All of this, the sacrifice that he gave, the redemption that he brought, the fact that God himself experienced life. We should have written down here the incarnation, that God became man. This is all the gospel. She's, she's going to write that down there. <laughs> the incarnation. It's just in car. Nay, shun. T I O N. Very good. That word I do know how to spell. <laughs> this is all of the gospel of Jesus. And what is Paul saying? You are to, act, you are to live in a way in which whatever happens in your life, it does not matter what has happened in your life. Give me all the excuses. It doesn't matter. You conduct yourself or you live like a, like a citizen of heaven, worthy 
of this. And when we humble ourselves before the cross and realize that the gospel of Jesus is the Roman version of crucifixion, then we sit there and say, I am I living my life worthy of the cross? I living my life worth. But, but they, no excuses, whatever, an absolute. Paul then goes on, Paul then goes on and begins to talk about another absolute because whatever happens, conduct yourself in a manner worthy of the gospel. And he goes on and he says this. Then, whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know. This is a definition of integrity. If you want to be a person of integrity, then you live your life the same way whether someone is looking or they're not looking. It doesn't matter whether you're in front of the pastor or not. Great thing, greatest thing, you know, you know, <laughs> you know, it's like, like, curse. Oh, I'm sorry, Pastor Raymond. <laughs> Happens all over the community. The thing is, is if you feel guilty about cursing in front of me, a person of integrity then will not curse. If you feel guilty about act certain actions when I'm around, and that's not like I'm pure and holy, okay? It's just that when, when we are around, we have the Christian Raymond and then the outside of Christian Raymond, okay? You have the, I'm with my church board and members of my church and, and everybody, and then I am home with my family. And sometimes, sorry to say, there's two different types of people. We're all that way. I got caught on this verse this past week. We're all that way. Where we live one way in front of everybody, you know, especially at home. We're more tolerant. Right now, here at church, you know, we're more tolerant with people and understanding, and we don't want to hurt people's feelings. We get with our immediate family. Hey, everything's open. <laughs> you annoy me, I'm going to yell. You say something, I'm going to say this. You do this, I'm going to react this way. And we live one way, and then we live another way. We live worthy of the cross when people are watching. We don't, we live the way we want to live when nobody's watching. The idea of integrity, and Paul is saying here, whether I'm with you and whether I'm with you or I'm not with you, this is I know that you are going to be living a life as if you are a citizen of heaven, whether I'm there or whether I'm away. And then he goes on and he says this. Um, then whether I come and see you, I will know that you stand firm. This word is being planted, good base, standing firm, in the love of God, not being able to be moved. When things come your way, you can handle it. I, 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 I you know, it's not, you know, look, <clears throat> I told this story this past week. To somebody, I'll tell you the story. I don't even remember if I told the story anymore, okay? To, you know, who I told it to anymore. I used to remember all the stories I told. Now I'm telling people three or four times in <coughs> one story. I'm like, did you know? Oh, I already heard that. Yeah, okay. Well, you'll probably hear it again. <laughs> one of the pastors, I'm going to be totally honest with you. Listen, one of the pastors' meetings on our, in, in the Zoom meeting, he was very concerned because he has not visited the people in his congregation. And he's like, I, I don't want to get somebody upset with me because I didn't go and visit them. I don't want to do this. I don't want to do that. Andy Russell said something. And then I said, I don't do well baby checkups anymore. There comes a time in a Christian's life where the pastor does not need to be going after them to find out how they are doing spiritually. It's called maturity. It's called standing firm. 
It's called, I expect you to live a certain way just like you expect me to live a certain way, whether I am with you or not or whether you are with me or not. If you stop going to church because you're upset with somebody or me and you don't tell them, shame on you. Grow up. Because that is not what Paul is talking about, to go and yell at your pastor, to go and be upset with the people of the church because I haven't been to church for three months and nobody even called me. He is saying whatever happens in your life, whatever you do, act as though you are worthy of this. So that when I come to you, or if I'm not with you, I know you are standing firm, not being swayed, not being moved. The district superintendent was right on there, didn't chastise me, didn't even send me an email, didn't even call me, because we in the pastorate have discovered that we have somehow this role has morphed into, I need to go and make sure that everybody's Christian life is right. And Paul is saying this, it is your responsibility. And if I don't come and see you, I know that you are what? Standing firm in your, in your <laughs> it's okay. Standing firm, how? Get this, in the one spirit. In the one spirit. The new NIV is the only translation that puts a capital S on this one. Because this is not in one spirit like they talk about in the, in the rest of, you know, be unified. This is talking about in the one spirit. We, he knows that we are standing firm in the Holy Spirit. Why didn't we just put Holy Spirit then? Is that what Paul meant? Because that's not what Paul wrote. <laughs> he wrote, similar, he wrote uh, the word that he put down there is, in the one spirit, the spirit that you, you can see, this is what Paul is saying. In order to be one in spirit, guess what you have to be in? The Holy Spirit. So if we are one in spirit, standing firm, one in spirit, then the Holy Spirit is living through us. And what does the Holy Spirit do in us? He purifies us, sanctifies us, changes us. What is it? He may, helps us to understand what this agape love is. And what is that? Self-denying love. It's not about me. It's about me. And Andy Russell went on and says, I expect my, my board members and my church people to call each other. They don't expect me to call them. Because it's about all of us. You know, <laughs> yeah, just, just think about this. Think about this. I call you periodically to find out how you're doing. Hey, what's going on? Send you a little prayer here and there and, and different things, okay? When was the last time, some of you have done it, rarely, that you've called me and said, hey, pastor, I've been thinking and praying for you this past week. How you doing? Usually what happens is, oh, no, someone's calling. <laughs> Who died? <laughs> Happened this morning, 6.30 in the morning, Donna DeBrincy's phone number comes up. Oh, no. So I, I, I had to let it go to voicemail because I didn't want to disturb Tanya, and so I got up, called her back. Knew, I already had one of three people. 90% was one person. <laughs> you know, this way, oh, there's a phone call. You know, Timothy calls. Oh, now what did he do? <laughs> Oh, yeah. Well, okay, we just won't go there. Then he finishes up, that I will know that you stand firm in one spirit, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel. 
What Paul wants us to understand here is this, this concept of one, striving together um, as one, uh, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel. This phrase is kind of a difficult translation. The word one is, is actually the same word that they use for soul, not spirit, but for soul. Okay, it's the same word, one. In order to have a soul, you are one in spirit with the Holy Spirit. That is what your soul is. Your soul is supposed to be one with God, one with Jesus, one with the Holy Spirit. The NIV um, uses, uses the word man. The, okay, there's where it is. The old NIV, all right, basically translated, striving together as one man. <laughs> okay, it's the only translation that uses this phrase. Um, it's really bad. <laughs> okay. Translations can be bad. Well, the KJV is it? No, the KJV has a lot of problems. Okay, because actually the KJV right here uses as one conversation, and the word conversation does not mean the same as it did 500 years ago. It's much different. Word conversation was me me meant the sp spoken word of a person. The, the, who that person is, um, conversation is now as you and I just chatting with each other. Okay, the NIV wanted to move away from that and used one man. <laughs> and the funny, the, the funny problem, the funny thing about that is that the word here is in feminine form. <laughs> but they didn't want to use one woman. <laughs> so they, and no other translation, even the new NIV has changed it and corrected their mistake back then. They're trying to get the idea of one mankind, one body, one person um, without using a personal thing because you're trying to write, again, a translation is trying to write in English what Paul wrote, okay? so that we can then understand the word of God. Uh, the, so in the Old Testament, the word heart meant the soul, the center of the being, the very essence of a, of a person. And their mind, body, and emotions were all together in the heart. That's where we get a lot of heart theology, Christ coming into the heart of a person. Okay, I, <laughs> I growing up, when we had this heart theology, and asked, did you ask Jesus into your heart? I'm like, I didn't know how he lived there. I thought he was living in an organ. Then when I discovered that in the Old Testament, the word heart meant myself. You were inviting, we shouldn't use heart theology. We should use life. You're inviting him into your life. He's becoming the center being of your life. In the New Testament, it, it's translated as one. Um, it's translated as soul. So you're coming into the soul of a person was the heart, mind, body of a person that is the reason why jesus says to love your god with all your what heart soul mind and strength your whole being every part of you is supposed to love jesus so what he is saying here basically is striving together as a being as one being heart soul mind and strength as one the very essence of who you are for the faith of the gospel. This, this, term, this term actually takes on a sports term. It's, it means that this, this term of, of one takes on a sports term. It's standing side by side in a sporting match, in an arena. Uh, you're standing battling the other side in a, in a, in a, in a struggle to win. Okay, And you are, you are one as a team for the sake of the gospel. Paul, Paul basically is telling us, do not disqualify yourself. Don't disqualify yourself. God does not penalize us the rest of our lives when we disqualify ourselves. But what he is saying here. When you are in a situation in life and you respond a certain way, you now have the choice of disqualifying yourself for the gospel of Christ or being qualified to share the gospel of Christ. In every situation, 
that's basically where we stand. Now, the thing is, is when we fail, God does not disqualify us for the rest of our lives. But in that moment, he, we have disqualified ourselves. And we are no longer able to be used by God. You get that? Very key. Good example of this. Driving down the street, someone cuts you off and you give them the high sign. Jesus is number one. <laughs> you disqualified yourself to be used at that moment. Because you are no longer worthy of Christ's gospel. So he's saying, number one, absolute, live honorably. Number two, absolute, do not disqualify yourself. And then he goes on to the third absolute. Why? Because you are going to face opposition in your life. He says, without being frightened in any way, he says, when you face opposition, don't be frightened because here's an absolute of life. You will be facing opposition. You want to live for Christ? You think that's the way it's going to be? You want to have the love of Christ in you? You want all this wonderful, joyous stuff to happen in your life? Guess what? People aren't going to like you, and that's okay. Some people are just not going to get along with you. That's why I hate Facebook. If I write something on Facebook, they disagree with you, guess what? They're going to unfriend me because that's the mature thing to do. Unfriend somebody who you disagree with. We do it in the church. We don't like somebody's lifestyle. What do we do? Unfriend them. Well, that's those people. You got the sinners and the Christians, right? We have the Christians and those people. <laughs> Our fallback position is always fear. And Paul is saying this is an absolute do not be afraid. This word afraid is terrified. It, it actually takes on the picture of walking up to a herd of horses and going, Aah! and watching the horses go, <laughs> Okay. In terror, racing, not knowing where they're going, scattering everywhere. That's the terror, he's saying. Do not be afraid. Do not scatter. No one in any way, no way, no how, no one is excluded. Do not live in fear. by those who oppose you. So Paul is saying here, you need to li live in a respectful, honorable way so that you're not disqualifying yourself so that when you face opposition, you will be worthy of the gospel of Jesus. You will know how to deal appropriately with your adversary and I know it shocks some of you that someone out there may not like you okay I know you know you know, you know if you're like me you know one person gets upset for whatever reason and it's like my whole day my whole life is messed up I'm I, you know because I want everybody to like me okay it's okay if certain people are not liking you because of the way you are living your life not necessarily being con condemning of somebody. Listen, listen. This isn't that, that people are going to oppose you because you condemn a certain life or a lifestyle or person. This is because of the lifestyle you are living that they are opposed to you. We were talking, you know, we were talking, I'm not going to get into the whole conversation, but we live in a society. My wife, my wife and I were talking and then we hear, that's kind of new for us to talk to each other. <laughs> and, 
And we were talking way here, and, and, and in this situation that we were talking about, I said, you know what's really cool about American society? If you don't like what they preach, you can only find a church that will preach what you want them to preach. You don't like the lifestyle that I say we're supposed to live? That's okay. You can find a church out there that will be loving and accepting of your lifestyle. Why do you sit and fight me? Go and find that church. Because that's what we do with the gospel. Okay? We change it so it can become what I want it to become. And what is Paul saying? No matter what happens, you are to live, boom, worthy of the gospel of Jesus. What he's saying here, what he says, by those, do not be afraid, by those who oppose you, do not be afraid of your adversary, because he goes on and he says this, this is a sign to them that they will be destroyed, but that you will be saved, and that by God. Basically he's saying, why are you so afraid of people in this world? Why are you changing your life, doing the things? Why are you acting certain ways? Why are you acting unworthy of the gospel because of people in this world, because of situations when you should be facing this world without fear? You should be facing your adversary without fear because you will be, we learned this last week, vindicated for your lifestyle for being right. If you are in relationship with Jesus and that relationship is changing you and we have given ourselves over to the cross of Jesus and we are living in every situation worthy of the cross, then we do not live in fear when somebody opposes us because we will be vindicated later on in life and it may not be till eternity and those that oppose the cross will face destruction. It's not like you walk all pious and say, hey, you don't like me, that's okay, you're going to get yours, I'm going to get mine. That's not what they're saying. They're saying that, Paul is saying, don't worry, you live your life according to the gospel of Jesus. That's where I have to ask the question. Is your life worthy of the gospel of Jesus? See, the thing is, is Jesus says, yes, your life is worthy. Sometimes we don't live a life that is worthy. Sometimes we as Christians need to sit down and ask ourselves, did my attitude disqualify me? of the gospel did my actions disqualify me of the gospel did my comments disqualify me of the gospel did the joke that I just shared disqualify me from the gospel did the news that I just passed on disqualify me of the gospel and when we start sitting down and looking at the way we live our lives with people and we say, did my actions, did the way I live my life make me worthy of the gospel or disqualify me? When we are very true to ourselves, we become humble before Christ and say, no. No. And it's not because I'm ADHD or because I'm this or that or, 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 or things. It just did not act worthy of the gospel. No excuse. This morning, are you living your life worthy of the gospel? Or are you just out there doing your own thing in the name of Jesus, just like the world is doing their own thing in the name of themselves. And this isn't about, hey, 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 can my attitude be proven in the Bible? 
I have a right to be angry. It's called righteous indignation. As a matter of fact, Jesus was angry. So I can be mad. I can be, I can, the words I used was because, you know, Jesus used those words. He cures the first fig tree. Okay, whatever. We can take the Bible and we can defend ourselves or we can lay at the cross and say, is my lifestyle worthy of the cross of Jesus? Is my lifestyle worthy of the, the gospel of Jesus? This morning, I'm going to sing some songs. I'm going to pray. During the prayer time, I'm going to anoint Anna. I just something that you need to, each of us need to think about. It's what I am doing worthy of the gospel of Christ. Sweet pieces broken and scattered in mercy Lord, we thank you for challenging us. We thank you, God, for the way you move in our hearts and the way you move in our lives. And we ask you, Lord, that you will continue 
to help us see the areas of our life where we need to change in order to be worthy of the gospel, to be worthy of your death, to be worthy of your suffering, to be worthy of the anguish. Lord, in everything that we do, everything that we say, every place that we go, our whole being, we want that to be worthy of the gospel of Jesus. Change us, Lord. Lord, be with Maureen as she heals. Continue to touch her life, her mind, her soul, her body, Lord. She's been through a lot so far. And this is a long road of recovery, and we ask you to continue to be with her. Begin, be with Donna and, and Linda and the whole family as they grieve the loss of grace. And be with our church, Lord. She was a wonderful wonderful lady in our church we know where she's at there's no doubt in our mind she's with you right now Lord we anoint Anna in the name of the Father, Son and the Holy Spirit and we ask you Lord that you will heal her you'll heal her body the Holy Spirit will come upon her in a mighty and glorious way we ask you, Lord, to fill the, the doctors with this knowledge of the Spirit of God to, to, to treat her appropriately. Touch her, Lord. We love her. We, thank, we, we are thankful for her. And just now let the healing power of God's Spirit to move through her body. Lord, we are a church that wants to be worthy of you. We thank you, God. We praise you. In your name, amen. Okay, I, I, I boo-booed with you guys, and I'm not going to make you wait any longer. <clears throat> I looked at the clock. It was 10.30. I said, oh, look, it's only 11.30. We got a lot of time this morning. <laughs> and I was shooting for the, the 12 o'clock mark which is actually 15 minutes past what we're supposed to end this morning because we started early. So we're, we're not going to sing that third song. Sorry, I know you guys wanted to. We're just going to close. Uh, we're just going to have a little closing here and, and send yourself. What is better be good? Oh, okay. And somebody needs to remind me that, you know, we're ending at 10, <laughs> at 1045. We're not <laughs> ending at noon. So, all right, you know, um, we have an offering plate in the back. We have an offering plate at the back table as you go out. Remember, do not leave until our two beautiful ushers do dismiss you. Please wait until you get out of the church to do your socializing. It's just to keep our environment, our church safer. Music will play, and we, we, you know, I just don't want to keep you guys any longer. I know you'd love to hear this other song, but it's 11 o'clock. Uh, we probably lost half the uh, live stream because the ones that don't know we're starting at 1030 are wondering why we're ending the service. So if you've started at 1045, okay, go back to the beginning of the service. Our services will start at 930, whether we're indoors or outdoors for the rest of the summer. And now may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will. And may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Have a wonderful day. Enjoy the day that God has made for you.